Frederick, uh, you wanted to rise uh, up the economic problem related to multiple IVTs, which is indeed an important problem, particularly in our healthcare countries where IVTs are reimbursed. We are listening to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. IVT changed our practice. It improved results for patients, no doubt about it. But problem is not one IVT or some IVTs, but multiple IVTs. Let's see the Trojan horse of over standardization of easy protocol guidelines for multiple IVTs. It can be resumed with one question. What is the true value of IVTs if everyone can do it? What means nowadays an IVT protocol for AMD and, or for macular edema? Forget the patient, just see first OCT. Second, check if the disease is okay for an IVT. Then, start a protocol with multiple IVTs. Easy, too easy, but that means a bad medical reflection. Wet OCT is bad, dry is good. There is no semiological approach and no real individual treatment just over standardization of automatic decision-making to re-injection, mainly based on OCT. Just inject. Both protocols and the guidelines with OCT give full sense of security linked to our numbers and pictures dependence, acting like a true drug addiction. Just inject, but inject a lot. Other treatments become usual and potentially linked with immediate and repetitive money profit. But this money is protocols is tempting and politically correct. What is politically correct in macular edema treatment? In fact, first line free IVTs for treatment. And after that, you know the story. If macular edema recurrence, another IVT. If macular reluctant, do a lot of IVTs or switch. But still, a lot of IVTs. But could we do not so much IVTs? lot of questions. Why free IVT's first line for all? One example, if there is no more edema after just one IVT in retinal vein occlusion, why free IVT's? What about risk of atrophy? If macular edema decreases, sometimes visual acuity decreases too, and there is no correlation between CMT in OCT and visual acuity. What is the medical interest of strictly drying all edemas? What about patient with visual equity increase with delay without doing another IVT? It's not exception. And side effects of multiple IVTs, for example, tachyphylaxis. And what about possibilities of associate treatments to decrease number of IVTs? What about island surgery? And trying to find minimal numbers of IVTs useful for one patient. Don't you think that less IVT is not possible for majority of macular edema? Why shouldn't we ask these questions? No questions because answer is easy money for everyone and money is market. What is the market for IVTs? AMD, diabetics, RVO, and other maculophasis. Partners of this market are ophthalmologists. I think the real word is not partners, it's employees. But you know what? This market is oversized for us, for ophthalmologists. Balance clearly is in the IVT side. See the slide. Big pharma with more and more protocols, more and more IVTs, more and more elders, more and more diseases. On the other side, see the list of users, which are the employees. It includes you, retina specialists, and non-retina specialists too. But come on, see that. So much IVTs. It's too big for us. And other partners are required. But how did that happen? A market of IVT is simply oversized because of a visual sucker. Okay, F first big pharma provides IVT and IVT works for macular edema. But don't forget rule of an expanding market. It loves monopoly. And for IVTs, it was very important to discredit other treatments. That's what they done. Unfortunately, it was helped by the present perversion of evidence-based medicine with huge cost of studies only affordable for big pharma. Partners for this market were historically you, retina specialists, doing all IVTs, but follow the errors. 
With OCT expansions and protocols, all of ophthalmologists are now required for more IVTs. With time, number of chronic diseases expands. This means more IVTs once again. But problem, costs expand a lot. Payment of all of this depends to public health care system of prevent insurances, depending on country. And they worry about the price. It's already a huge call total cost for so much patient treated and so much repetitive exams. And it should dramatically increase with time. Performing it without changing all the system of payment and partner is an economic dead end. Evidence is that in retinal medical practice, the cost must decrease. How doing that? First, decrease the price product, it's down. Then step two, decrease remuneration per employee. And you are these employees. Guess what? You'll get that with a low cost future. Each exam, each IVT will lose value in the future. And step three, IVT is a very easy treatment which could be done by a nurse. Retinal imaging improvement with OCT leads to possibility of forties follow up which could be done by optometrist, orthoptist, or technician, and you will be fine. You will not anymore be the employees, and the market will continue to expand with profits. That's a vicious circle of much more IVTs, and that means convergence, convergence between expanding IVT, oversized market, and cost problem. as a real Trojan horse for beginning a new sharing economy in ophthalmology. Leading protocols done by Big Pharma and for mass use combined with lower necessity of an expert medical advice means that it could be done by other partners, which means everyone, if treatment is so safe and so easy. In clear, it means, it means short-time possibility of low-cost evolution, excluding ophthalmologists. Choice between hell and purgatory for us. If we don't do anything, we won't keep IVTs, except if we keep the role of guardians of the temple. We must keep medicine and practice as an art, complex but human, and use of IVT treatment still difficult for a non-retinal specialist and impossible for a non-medical practitioner. This is your problem, but you are the key. You are the case stone. You are the heart of every treatment. You must contest big pharma protocols by any means if it leads to automatic practice. You must help clinical research and work for alternative treatment if possible. Even if future, future is a connect medicine, you must keep decision and control medical validation for all retina treatment. You will sure have to work for smart algorithms and help patients for an individual treatment rather than a protocol. And fear, low-cost future with bad quality for both patients and you if you don't react. This is a potential special extra value for those remaining retinal surgeons which have continued to do true vitro retinal surgery and semiological medicine for macular edema rather than to inject everyone and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. So it's now place for discussion. So please, if you have any question, you can come to the microphone. Claude, yes. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to stand very firmly against the fact that EVRS macular edema study has weaknesses and numerous weaknesses. It is just the opposite. You might have thought it had weaknesses, weaknesses if you stand for the p-value methodology in statistics. In fact, it is not even true, because I had the study remade by renowned statisticians, high level working with for the industry and working for the universities. And they confirm the results. So even if you stand by the p-value methodology, the results happen to be confirmed. Now, very recently, in March 2016, the American Soci Association of Statistics published a stand no to p-value, saying that it is often misleading and under-informative. 
What did the EVRS macular edema study do? It used innovative for doctors methodology in statistics. But they were not innovative at all for high-level statisticians who have been fighting inside the American Society of Statistics to, for this to be clearly said and that everybody knows in the field of statistics. So if you stand by the p-value traditional in medicine, this study is confirmed. If you stand by what should be statistics in medicine, the study was right. Now, what is this study? What is the value of this study? It is called in high-level statistics an exploratory study, which means, and it, 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 it comes close to the uh, modern statistical uh, methodology called big data. It is not big data because big data is like 7,000 eyes and you might have seen at Arvo that there are groups like Paul Mitchell in Sydney and so forth who are using these methods and in the UK as well. You are collecting a high number of cases and you ask very few questions. And the high number of cases and the multi, in our case, the multiple origin of the responders to the, to the questions cancel the bias. This is why it has been found also true with the p-value just to the condition of retrieving the uh, cards with less than 150 eyes. So that was the first comment. I'd like really uh, EVR's members to understand that. That is not at all a weak study. That is, on the contrary, a very strong and powerful study. Now, uh, Agnieszka raised a very interesting point. Traction or not traction. Traction is not only at the tissue level, which is now the official recommendations. You should do vitrectomy only if there is vitromacular traction proven on a spectral domain OCT, which is traction at the tissue level. The, the point you have focused on, Agnieszka, is that traction starts at the cell level. And the macula is naturally equipped to fight that. These are, this is the role of the glial cells. And when they are overwhelmed, of course, edema uh, installs itself. But <laughs> Traction does not start, is not, um, tissue traction is the end point. It is not the start. The start is at the cell level. And the cells are equipped inside the cytoskeleton of cells. This is called interfilament proteins. And they are equipped to resist to stiffness, increased stiffness and traction. So you have raised exactly the point. The point is not there. The point is the concept of traction and what is underlying it. And, and, and current data in neurosciences knows that perfectly. It's perfectly established. It's just that the retinal community is not aware of research and does not apply it to the practice. Uh, regarding uh, Sengel, why you have found uh, the thickness about the same in your uh, series, it's because when there is severe ischemia, it is the astrocytes which are reacting. Uh, in the human eyes entire in vivo Yvette has studied, we show that there is no edema in the internal layers because the, retina, the astrocytes migrate and proliferate. This is, and the, uh, one of the cases was neovascular glaucoma. Uh, the eye removed for neovascular glaucoma. So extreme ischemia. Despite that, there was no edema in the internal retinal layers. So more or less, it's, not, it's, it's pretty logical you have found the, the same thickness. And uh, now I have a question for the talk about uh, venous pressure. Do you work with Joseph Flammer, Professor Joseph Flammer from Basel? No. 
No, because you know, this I, is I know him. <laughs> but this is exactly what he has developed. There is a company called Imodos from Jena in Germany. They have made up um, a tool to measure venous pressure. Venous pressure has a lot to do with ischemia and the role of endothelin. And in the Flammer syndrome, where young people, especially women, have a strong risk of devastating vascular accident in the eye, they measure the venous pressure. It's one of the three criteria to establish a diagnosis in addition to anamnesis. And uh, I have done, I have diagnosed several cases and published them recently, and including people who lost the eye in altitude and after an emotional stress. So venous pressure and what you're doing is, is extremely um, interesting and valid, clinically speaking. We, we can all do it. I think it's very, it should be an important sign in our evaluation. One. Thank you. Can I? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And yes, uh, ladies okay. first. So okay. yes, Okay. Thank you very much for the comment. This is exactly what I was trying to uh, to emphasize that uh, the traction occurs on the cellular level, and this is the level we are not able to detect in commercially available machines. So uh, there is an idea to remember about the vitrectomy as the option of the treatment because uh, removing the vitreos, the ILM, and inducing this reparation gliotic reaction within the retina is, uh, is giving a chance to the retina to be stimulated and to fight against, against edema again. This is, this is as uh, Claude said yesterday, on her very, very beautiful uh, lecture, that this is non-pharmacological help for the retina to induce reparation uh, respond. Yeah, uh, just a point. Uh, during uh, last year, Arvo, uh, I saw Bob Nussenblatt showing a very good uh, uh, idea. He will be able to perform immunomarkers uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and try to target uh, uh, and better understand our diseases, and I think it would be useful in our clinics. This is how it is done uh, in a scientific matter, but it would be very difficult to present this in such a matter on during the Congress, having uh, four minutes. So I tried to simplify it as as much as possible. That's why I did not use any sophisticated names and yeah. all these slides, but to make it <laughs> just <okay>. understand, <laughs> that's very it, complicated. Yeah. Yeah. One more point. Um, what we know from the um, uh, from the marked uh, uh, bevacizumab, the penetration through the membranes is completely disappointed. So probably um, the, when you remove mm -hmm. something, it's allowed to, 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 to penetrate the, 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 the agents. Sure. Yeah. And one more thing. Um, I think um, uh, the, when you go to the numbers from the any any machines, it's differ from individual to individual. And nobody knows uh, which pressure is a normal for you and for me, for him. And probably I, I look for uh, a pulsating of the vein when I pressure with my finger. I saw that the, the, the blinking of the, of the vein, firstly, uh, I, we know from the Goldman uh, that the artery blinks a lot, but when the, um, the uh, venous comes at the same uh, sign, so that's make me sure what is the venostatic pressure now. So that's very interesting. I know the um, Dr. Flammer is very popular in my mind, but uh, uh, I will check that for... Thank you. Next question. Wilson Herriot from Australia. Um, thank you for talking about um, laser anastomosis, but uh, I've been looking at that with the, with the Oximap system. One of the things that becomes very important is that we keep talking about ischemia, which means effectively no vessels, no flow, and we look at it thinking about it angiographically. The problem is the disease is mediated by the hypoxia, and you can have ischemia with a central retinal artery occlusion that kills the inner retina, but it won't be hypoxic. So there's not a strong correlation between the area of non-perfusion and the VEGF drive that modifies 
um, macroedema. So that applies in vein occlusions like the Copernicus study, etc. And in fact, in the study you presented with the diabetic non-perfusion. So we have to think physiologically physiologically that our tests of angiography don't really give us a good indicator. The other thing very briefly is that, is that Ian McAllister is obsessed about not the absolute venous pressure but the relative position of the venous bank pressure compared with arteriolus systolic because the real complications come when, when you go above arteriolar diastolic in effect, vein occlusions are a, a slow modified artery occlusion where the obstruction is at the outflow, not at the inflow. So I think that hypoxia is something we have to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Batman from Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Hammond for his uh, insight into what's going on in the real world. And uh, uh, I agree with you that we don't really have to be slave of the industry or just follow the guidelines. Uh, to my simple mind, if something doesn't work one time, twice, three times, it won't be working for the tenth time. So there's no point of keeping up uh, hoping for something to happen. Um, uh, for Dr. Tanev, the um, very nice presentation, you revived the LICRA. The LICRA used to be, uh, you know, years back in vogue, and but the difficulties of inducing the shunts made it in the, uh, you know, placed within the run an, an, an old technique. So the, uh, my question to you is that, you know, the, I always think about the eye about differential pressure. So we have uh, a higher pressure going into a lower pressure to be allowed to, for the flow to continue. How would you gauge your finger thinking about all what's going on with the arterial venous pressure, the hypoxia, the ischemia that would uh, uh, um, uh, allow the flow or the non-flow and then go through the very clear guideline you gave uh, to us uh, to try to follow uh, to get rid of the ischemia that is present there. I think uh, the, my, my finger helped me to, to, to see when the blinking of the artery appear. Uh, the normal uh, situation, the venous presence should be disappear as well. But when the, 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 the disappearing of the venous uh, flow uh, persist, even I press a lot with my fingers, so that showed me that the clear uh, elevation of the hydrostatic pressure. So that's, um, it's difficult to be managed by other uh, techniques. Do, do you consider the intraocular pressure as a, 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 like a, a combined factor here, like, you know, the IOP, if it's high, would this affect also your pressure in or out? Yes, but when you uh, look at the pressure of uh, 40, 45, without pressing, you see the blinking of the artery. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah sometimes. One last question. Yes. Bongo Zindamoyen from Kenya and um, from Central African Republic, too. <laughs> My question is about uh, island pill in macular edema. From the EVR study, I always try to convince my colleagues to adopt it. Some who have done a few, they always tell me, because most of the time we have patients that come late. The visual acuity is already very much compromised, and they say with ILM or without ILM, the visual acuity doesn't improve much. Why do, should I do ILM pill? So I would like to ask you people, I, I find myself, I don't have no answer to tell them to convince them. So what will you say? Sorry, um, My question is, since when the patient come late, whether you give in, okay. intravitreal well, injection or you do ILM, the visual acuity doesn't improve. Sorry. So uh, why should you do <laughs> ILM pill? Start praying, probably. Uh, when the patient comes very late, and this yeah. is, uh, I have lots of lots of diabetic patients like that. It is very frustrated, frustrating to treat those patients because no matter what you do, uh, you are kind of in a lost situation. That's, I can see that. Uh, I do uh, vitrectomy. I peel ILM because I want to be sure I did everything I could to save the vision. So I want to have uh, you know, clear conscience that I absolutely did everything. But, I, but I'm sure that the point is in a different place. The point is to operate and to treat those people earlier. Because if photoreceptors are lost, you cannot do whatever you do, the, the eye will not work. 
the, the, the thing with, uh, with uh, persistent edemas is that the uh, causing factor is in the eye. And no matter what you do, you are not able to remove the injuring factor, like in diabetes, for example. The diabetes is there and will be destroying the eye day by day by day. The only thing you can do is to slow this process and to help the retina to restore. And you can do it in pharmacological way or surgical way, non-pharmacological way. And um, it's whatever you choose in the end stage of the disease, it's, it would be difficult. So yeah. treat earlier. Do not wait till the changes are so profound that nothing can be saved in the eye. We need to work on health, on living tissue, not on something living. that is Anybody that is body. dead. Because you know yeah. there was one guy that was supposed to resurrect and save everybody, but I don't think we can do the same as he does. Yeah. And I just think to, to, uh, everybody totally agree with it, no? Just a, a, a part of the answer is in my communication. And you have to deal with ischemia or edema. So if they come late, but they still have edema, you can go to surgery and know that you will have, and you will see the a, a, a slide showing that the increase in logmar line is quite good with the late uh, uh, surgery. But if you have ischemia or in RVO, mac hemorrhage, macular invasion, there is no result. So uh, the, the, the analysis of uh, the semiological analysis of the retina will answer to your question. But I propose you to come back after the second round to, to ask again your question if you want, because we need to move on. And I think you will have many other answers now.